Hello, I'm Stephen McCurry, Executive Director of the Pasadena Conservatory of Music. Welcome to the second of our musical interludes for this year. Each interlude is a concert conceived in response to a book. Our second book, The Vexations, a novel shaped, even governed by facts, as the author Caitlin Horrocks puts it, is about the composer Eric Satie, his siblings Louise and Conrad, and his friends and enemies. The following vignettes, drawn from passages in the novel and Satie's scholarship, offer glimpses into that world. Our thanks to Steinway & Sons for providing the piano for this concert, which was filmed in Monk Space, Koreatown, LA. It's 1925. Eric's friend Roger unlocks the door. He steps aside, gesturing for my brother Conrad to do the honors. No one has entered Eric's apartment in Arcoy since his death, and nearly no one in all the 27 years he lived there. Dusty light filters in from the hallway, and slowly the contents of the apartment become visible. A great profusion of umbrellas and walking sticks, stacks of handkerchiefs, 86 it will turn out, Mountains of yellowed newspapers, a small table with a single chair, a wardrobe that contains six identical gray velvet suits, a battered piano. There is no easy way to catalog Eric's possessions under the filth. Wordlessly, Roger and Conrad lift the lid of the piano. Inside is a morass of cut wires, scattered wooden hammers, the unstrung guts of the instrument mixed with drifts of papers, unopened letters, bills, notebooks, one loose leaf page contains two lines of music and a note about how to prepare oneself to play the piece 840 times in succession. As if Eric ever would in a thousand years have had the patience to do such a thing. My brother was always difficult to understand. It didn't seem that he was ever perfectly normal. People called him Monsieur Le Pauvre, Mr. Poor, or the Velvet Gentleman, for the identical velvet suits he wore year in and year out. From his music and words, we wonder, is he sincere? Is he playing the provocateur? Is he having fun? Is he making fun of? Those of us close to him, we're not sure ourselves. Stravinsky said Eric was the oddest person he had ever known, but the most rare and consistently witty person, too. He had a great liking for him, and he thought Eric liked him in return. 
Conrad said that Eric was a man of transcendent idealism. It had nothing but disdain for the realism which clouded the intelligence of his contemporaries. Debussy described Eric as a gentle medieval musician who strayed into this century.
Eric was a creature of the cafes and cabarets of Paris. He did most of his composing in cafes and wasn't above letting it show in his music. Once, after quarreling with the manager of Le Chat Noir, where he was the backup pianist, Eric left abruptly and got an engagement as a pianist at the Auberge de Clou, a boisterous and inexpensive nightclub. And it was there that the historic meeting between Eric and Claude Debussy took place, a chance meeting that developed into a lifelong friendship. Debussy's friend, Louis Laloy, described the character of their peculiar friendship as stormy but indissoluble. They were like two brothers, the one rich, the other poor, the one generous but conscious of his superiority, the other unhappy between his jester's mask, hiding his feelings of inferiority but keeping up his jokes in order to amuse his friend both on guard against one another, but all the time bound by the ties of genuine affection.
Suzanne Valadon was a turbulent young woman given to accessorizing her outfits with homemade necklaces of carrots and sausages. In her teens, she became an acrobat, but her career was interrupted by a trapeze accident. She later turned to painting, where she gained some success, while also modeling for artists such as Toulouse-Lautrec, Renoir, and Degas. Eric first met Suzanne in 1893 at the Auberge de Clou. She was sitting at a corner table with her current lover when Eric joined them. Within minutes, he was in love. Within hours, he proposed. She immediately agreed, but since it was three in the morning, it was an impossible time to get to the courthouse. So they retired to his apartment at the Rue Corteau and commenced a torrid, or as some have said, a traumatic love affair that lasted six months. She was Eric's only love interest, as far as any of us knew. Eric wrote a trio of pieces about sea creatures titled with their scientific names. He dedicated the first to Suzanne. Each piece was introduced with made-up facts and false descriptions. Beneath the lines of music, there were little exhortations supposedly from the crustaceans themselves. It was a really pretty boulder, or nice and sticky, or I have no tobacco, good thing I don't smoke. The pieces were collages with phrases of shamelessly lifted music from Chopin and music hall numbers, not particularly crustacean-like, but twirling like sea foam in a shallow tidal pool. Conrad thought they were some of Eric's best work.
continued to give his piano compositions absurd titles and often added running commentaries of quips and nonsensical remarks to the scores. Sommerfeld Eric adopted these peculiar methods as a mask to put critics off the scent. If they were discerning enough, they would appreciate the real value of the music underneath its fantastic presentation. If not, and it would be easy for them to dismiss it all as a joke. The pianist, Alfred Cartot, felt these commentaries were an integral part of Satie's musical conception. Eric was unequivocal. I forbid the text to be read aloud during a performance of the music. Failure to conform with these instructions will cause the transgressor to incur my just indignation. Here is a sampler from the first movement of the bureaucratic Sonatina. Off he goes. He makes his way merrily to the office. He is pleased and wags his head. He is in love with a fair and most elegant lady. And also with his pen holder. And for the third movement, he hums an old Peruvian air, which he collected from a deaf mute in Lower Brittany. A nearby piano plays Clementi. How sad it is.
In his later years, Eric turned to composing works for the theater and collaborated with the likes of Jean Cocteau, Pablo Picasso, Sergei Diaghilev, and other avant-garde artists of the time. A group of emerging composers was drawn to Eric's anti-romantic, anti-German aesthetic and looked to him as a sort of mentor. He called them les nouveaux jeunes, the new youth. The critic, Henri Collette, later coined the term Les Six. In describing this circle of friends, Cocteau said, we were unbearable, and it was right to be. Is it not the role of youth to rear up against whatever exists? Sati taught what at that time was the greatest audacity, simplicity. We had heard enough of the clouds, waves, aquariums, nymphs, nocturnal scents found in the impressionistic school, what we needed was everyday music. And as Aurique said, we were to compose music that gave auditory pleasure without demanding a disproportionate effort from the listener.
It is 1888. Eric is 21 years old, almost 22. The most popular seven minutes he will ever write are fading away in the sweaty, soot-dark room. A piano note is dying from the moment it is struck, hammer to string. The vibrations slow, the note decays, a birth and a death with every press of the keys. The last sounds of the gymnopédie hang and dissipate like smoke and then are gone. His life is long yet, but the thing people will love best about him is already finished. Let us hope he does not know it. How would he live otherwise? How would any of us, if we knew all that was to come? <laughs>